Chapter Sixteen of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen. I slept soundly and I rose refreshed, although my hands were very stiff and my head was not without its pains from the rude treatment that each had undergone. No one in the house was up when I woke, and saddling my own horse as well as I could, I left word with the old gardener that I should return before the hour of breakfast, and set out for Lourdes. If I was not always very considerate in forming my resolutions, as the wise axiom recommends, I was certainly not slow in executing them, and I now proceeded at full speed to fulfil my determination of the night before in regard to the chevalier. Stopping at Arnaud's house, I threw myself off my horse, entered his étude, which appeared to be just opened, nor did the least doubt enter my mind that the person I sought was still there. The first thing, however, that I perceived was the enormous head of the old procureur himself, looking through the sort of barred screen that surrounded his writing-table, like some strange beast in a menagerie. I was not very much inclined to treat this incubus of the law with any great civility on my own account, as I was aware that, for some reason to himself best known, he bore me no extraordinary love. But as Helen's father, he commanded other feelings, and I therefore addressed him as politely as I could. In answer to my inquiries for the chevalier, he bowed most profoundly, replying that the Monsieur de Montenero would be quite in despair when he found that I had come to honour him with a visit only five minutes after his departure. "'What? Is he gone already?' cried I. "'When did he go? Where did he go to?' "'He is indeed, I am sorry to say, gone, Monsieur le Comte,' replied the procureur, "'and in answer to your second interrogatory I can reply that he has been gone precisely nine minutes and three quarters, but in regard to the third question, all I can depone is that I do not at all know, only that he spoke of being absent some three months or more. Angry, vexed, and disappointed, I turned unceremoniously on my heel, and as I went out I heard a sort of suppressed laugh issued through the wide, unmoved jaws of the procureur, whose imperturbable countenance announced nothing in the least like mirth. And yet I am certain that he was at that moment laughing most heartily at the deceit he had put upon me, for, as I afterwards learned, the chevalier was in his house at the very time. The distance between Lourdes and the chateau was narrowed speedily, and on my arrival I found the domestic microcosm I had left behind, sound asleep an hour before, now just beginning to buzz. My father had not yet quitted his own room, but the servants were all bustling about in the preparations of the morning, and as I rode up, old Ussay himself, recovered from his drunkenness, sneaked into the court like a beaten dog. Not that he was at all ashamed of having been drunk, it was part of his profession, but upon the road he had heard my adventures of the night before detailed in very glowing language, and he justly feared that the indignation of the whole household would fall upon his head for having been absent in the moment of danger. Beckoning him to speak to me, I gave him a hint that I had been tender of his name, and that, if he chose to keep his own counsel, he might yet pass scatheless from the rest of the family. "'I shall punish you myself, Maître Rousset, continued I, "'for I will teach you to get drunk at proper times and seasons only.' "'As I hope to live,' answered the trumpeter, "'I did but drink two cups, and you well know, monsieur, that two cups of wine to me—' or the maitre d'hôtel, who have drunk so many hundred tons in our lives, is but as a cup of cold water to another man. They must have drugged those two cups, for a certainty they must have been drugged. At breakfast I found Helen with my father. They were alone, for my mother was ill from the agitation of the night before, and had remained in her own chamber, desiring not to be disturbed. The moment my steps sounded in the vestibule, Helen's eyes darted towards the door, and I could see the flush of eagerness on her cheek, and the paleness that then overspread it, as she saw my head bound up, and then again the blood mounting quickly, lest any one should see the busy feelings of her swelling heart. It was a mute language which I could read as easily as my own thoughts, 
but still I would have given worlds to have been permitted to hear and speak to her with the openness of acknowledged love. The breakfast passed over, Helen left the hall, and after a few minutes' conversation my father went to the library, while I gazed for a moment from the window, meditating over a thousand hopes, in all of which Helen had her part, letting thought wander gaily through a thousand mazy turns, like a child sporting in a meadow without other object than delight, roaming heedlessly here and there, and gathering fresh flowers at every step. As I gazed, I saw the figure of Helen glide from the door of the square tower, and take her way towards the park. Now, now then, was the opportunity. She had promised not to avoid me any longer. Now then was the moment for which my heart had longed, more than language can express, and snatching a gun to excuse the wanderings, which indeed needed no excuse, I was hastening to pour forth the multitude of accumulated feelings, and thoughts, and dreams, and wishes, which had gathered in my bosom during so many months of silence, when I was called to speak with my father, just as my foot was on the step of the door. I will own that if ever I felt undutiful, it was then. However, I could not avoid going, and certainly with a very unwilling heart I mounted the stairs, and entered the library. My father had a letter in his hand, which I soon found came from the Countess de Soissons, and contained a reply favourable to my mother's request, that I might be placed near the person of the prince, her son, so well known under the name of Monsieur le Comte. My father placed it in my hands, and seemed to expect that I should be very much gratified at the news. But I could only reply, as I had done before, that I had not the least inclination to quit my paternal home, without, indeed, it was for the purpose of serving for a campaign or two in the armies of my country. "'Well, Louis,' replied my father, thinking me doubtless a wayward and whimsical boy, "'if you will look at the proscriptum, you will perceive that you are likely to be gratified in that point at least, for the Countess states that His Highness, her son, though at present at Sedan, from some little rupture with the court, is likely to receive the command of one of the armies. However, take the letter, consider its contents, and at dinner let me know when you will be prepared to set out. Glad to escape so soon, I flew out into the park in search of my beautiful Helen. It was now a fine day in the beginning of May, as warm as summer, as bright as lovely. Nature was in her very freshest robe of green, the air was full of sweetness and balm, and as I went, a lark rose up before my steps, and mounting high in the sunshine, hung a far speck upon its quivering wings, making the whole air thrill with its melodious happiness. I love the lark above all other birds, though there is something more tender and plaintive in the liquid music of the nightingale, yet there seems a touch of repining in its solitude and its gloom. But the lark images always, to my mind, a happy and contented spirit, who, full of love and delight, soars up towards the beneficent heaven, and sings its song of joy and gratitude in presence of all the listening creation. All objects in external nature have a very great effect upon my mind. Whether I will or not, they are received by my imagination as omens. And catching the lark's song as a happy augury, I sped on upon my way. As much had been done as possible to render the park, which extended behind the chateau, regular and symmetrical, but the ground was so uneven in its nature, so broken with rocks and hills and streams and dells, that it retained much more of the symmetry of nature than anything else, which, after all, to my taste, is more beautiful than aught man can devise. If Helen had wandered very far from the house, it would have been a difficult matter to have found her, but a sort of instinct guided me to where she was. I thought of the spot, I believe, which I myself would have chosen for lonely musing, a spot where a bower of high trees arched over a little cascade of about ten feet in height, whose waters, after escaping from the clear pool into which they fell, brushed quickly down the slanting ravine before them, nourishing the roots of innumerable shrubs, and trees, and flowers, and spreading a soft murmur and a cool freshness wherever they turned. Helen was sitting on the bank over which the stream fell, 
and though she held in her hand some piece of female work which while my mother slept she had brought out to occupy herself in the park yet her eyes were fixed upon the rushing waters of the fall at that moment catching a stray sunbeam that found its way through the trees the cascade had decorated itself with a fluttering iris which varied with a thousand hues waved over the cataract like those changeful hopes of life which hanging bright and beautiful over all the precipices of human existence still waver and change to suit every wind that blows along the course of time my footstep was upon the greensward so that helen heard it not and she continued to sit with her full dark eyes fixed upon the waterfall her soft downy cheek resting upon the slender graceful hand which might have formed a model for the statuary or the painter and her whole figure leaning forward with that untaught elegance of form and position which never but once did painter or statuary succeed in representing when she did hear me she looked up but there was no longer the quick start to avoid me as if she feared a moment's unobserved conversation her cheek it is true turned a shade redder and i could see that she was somewhat agitated but still those dear tender eyes turned upon me and a smile that owned she was happy in my presence broke from her heart itself and found its way to her lips dear dear helen said i seating myself beside her thank you for the promise that you would not avoid me and thank you for its fulfilment and thank you for that look and thank you for that smile oh helen you know not how like a monarch you are in having the power by a word or a glance or a tone to confer happiness and to raise from misery and doubt to hope and life and delight indeed louis answered she in a very different manner from that which i had ever seen in her before if i do possess such power i am not sorry that it is so for i am sure that while it remains with me to make you happy you shall never be otherwise you think it very strange she added with a smile to hear me talk as i do now and i would never never have done so had not circumstances changed but they have changed louis and as i now see some hope of she paused a moment as if seeking means to express herself and i saw a bright ingenuous blush spread over her whole countenance why should i hesitate to say it she added as i see some hope now of becoming your wife without entering into a family unwilling to receive me i know not why i should not tell you also this has made me so happy a thousand and a thousand thanks dearest helen answered i but tell me on what circumstance you who once doubted my parents consent so much more than i ever did now found expectations so joyful let me say for us both you must not ask me louis answered helen the only reason that could at all have influenced me to withhold from you what i hoped what i was sure would make you happy was that i felt myself bound to be silent on more than one subject you cannot fancy how i dislike anything that seems to imply mystery and want of confidence between two people that love one another and indeed it is the greatest happiness i anticipate in being yours that then i shall have neither thought nor feeling nor action that you may not know but in the present case you must spare me do not ask me louis if you love me of course however much my curiosity might be excited i put no farther question merely asking as calmly as i could fearful lest i should instil some new doubts in helen's mind if she was sure very sure that the joyful news she gave me was perfectly certain for i owned that it took such a burden from my heart i could scarce believe my own hopes all i can say louis answered she is that i feel sure neither your father nor your mother will object to our union when the time arrives to think that it may take place of course we are yet far too young too young said i why too young dear helen oh for many reasons she answered smiling you have yet to mingle with the world at least so i have heard people who know the world say that it is necessary for a young man to do before he dreams of marriage you have yet to see all the fair and the young and the gay 
which that world contains, before you can rightly judge whether your poor Helen may still possess your heart. "'And do you doubt me?' demanded I. "'Helen, you have promised me never to give your hand to another, and without one doubt or one hesitation do I promise the same to you, by yourself, by my hopes of happiness in this world or the next, by all that I hold sacred.' "'Hush, hush, dear Louis,' replied she. "'Do not swear so deeply. "'There are many, many temptations, I have heard, in the great world, "'which are difficult for a young man to resist. "'Louis, have you not found it so already?' "'There was a peculiar emphasis in her question "'which surprised and hurt me, "'but in a moment it flashed through my mind. "'The Chevalier had communicated his suspicions of me to Arnaud, and Arnaud had taken care to impart them to his daughter. I stood for a moment as one stupefied. Then, taking her hands in mine, I asked, Helen, what is it that you mean? Can you, do you in the least believe me guilty? No, Louis, no, dear Louis, answered she, with a look of full, undoubting, unhesitating confidence. If all the world were to declare you guilty, mine should be the dissenting voice and i would never never believe it i will not deny that tales have reached me which i do not dwell on because i am sure they are false basely and generously false or originating in some mistake which you can correct when you will and will correct when you ought do not explain them to me do not waste a word or a thought upon them as far as i am concerned she added seeing me about to speak for I believe not a word of them, not one single word. Oh, woman's love, it is like the sunshine, so pure, so bright, so cheering, and there is nothing in all creation equal to it. I threw my arms round her unopposed, I pressed my lips upon hers, but the kiss that I then took was as pure as gratitude for such generous affection could suggest. I say not that it was brotherly, for it was dearer, sweeter. But if there be a man on earth who says there was one unholy feeling mingled therein, I tell him, in his throat, he lies. At that moment the figure of a man broke at once through the boughs upon us. Helen turned, and, confused and ashamed at any one having seen her so clasped in my arms, fled instinctively like lightning, while the intruder advanced upon me in a menacing attitude. It was Jean-Baptiste Arnaud, and with a flushed cheek and a raised stick he came quickly upon me, exclaiming, "'Villain! You have seduced my sister, and, by the God above, your nobility shall not protect you!' "'Hear me, Arnaud!' cried I, but he still advanced with the stick lifted in an attitude to strike. My blood took fire, "'Hear me!' repeated I, snatching up my carbine. "'Hear me, or take the consequences!' And I retreated up the hill, with the gun pointed towards his breast. Mad, I believe, for his conduct can hardly be attributed to anything but frenzy. He rushed on upon me, without giving time for any explanation, and struck a violent blow at my head with his stick. I started back to avoid it. My foot struck against an angle of the rock. I stumbled, the gun went off, and Arnaud, after reeling for a moment with an ineffectual effort to stand, pressed his hand upon his bosom, and fell lifeless at my feet. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 there is nothing like remorse. It is the fiery gulf into which our passions and our follies lash us with whips of snakes. What language can tell the feelings of my bosom while I stood and gazed upon the lifeless form of Helen's brother, as he lay before me slain by my hand? And, oh, what words of horror and of agony did I not read in every line of that cold, still, mindless countenance, as it stared at me with an expression still mingled of the anger which had animated him, and the pang with which he had died. It was terrible beyond all description. My whole heart, and mind, and brain, and soul, 
was one whirl of dreadful sensations. I had done that which it was impossible to recall. I had taken from my fellow being that which I could never restore. I had extinguished the bright, mysterious lamp of life, and where, oh where, could I find the Promethean flame wherewith to light it again to action and to being? In vain, the irrevocable deed had gone forth, and sorrow and tears and regret and agony could have no more effect upon it than on the granite of the mountains that surrounded me. It was done. It was written on the book of fate. It was between me and my God. A dreadful account never to pass from my memory. I felt the finger that had branded murderer on the brow of Cain, tracing the same damning word in characters of fire upon my heart and yet i gazed on upon the thing that i made with horror amounting to stupefaction like the head of the gorgon it seemed to have turned me into stone and though i would have given worlds to have banished it for ever from my sight and my memory i stood with my eyes fixed upon it as if i sought to impress every lifeless lineament on my remembrance with lines that time should never have power to efface a heavy hand laid upon my shoulder was the first thing that roused me and turning round i beheld pedro garcias the spanish smuggler standing by my side the discharged gun was still in my hand the bleeding corpse lay before me and had he had occasion to ask who had done the deed whose consequences he beheld I am sure that my countenance would have afforded a sufficient reply. No one but a murderer could have looked and felt as I did. "'How did this happen?' asked he bluntly, and without giving me either name or title, for no one could look upon the humbling object before us, and cast away one name of honour upon earthly rank. For a moment I gazed upon the smuggler wildly and vacantly, for the strong impression of the thing itself had almost banished from my mind the circumstances that preceded it. But recollecting myself at length, I gave him a scarcely coherent account of what had happened. "'You should not have seduced his sister,' replied the smuggler, fixing his large dark eye upon me. "'You men of rank think that the plain bourgeois feels not a stain upon his honour as the loss of his child's or his sister's virtue, but they do.' They do, as bitterly, as keenly, as madly, as the proudest count that ever spread his banner to the wind. "'Seduce his sister! Seduce Helen!' cried I, turning quickly upon him. "'It is false! Who dares to say it? I would not wrong her for a world, not for a thousand worlds!' "'That changes the case,' replied the smuggler. "'He wronged you, then, and deserved to die. But come away from this spot!' fie do not look so ghastly we shall all wear his likeness one day and it matters little whether it be a day sooner or a day later but come along to the mill harm may come of this for his father will not want friends to pursue this deed to the utmost come come you shall not stay here and risk your life too one dead man is enough for one day at least come so saying he hurried me away to the mill where we found the door apparently locked, the wheel at rest, and the miller out. But on tapping three times, thrice repeated, we were admitted by the miller, who seemed somewhat surprised to see me with Garcias. The event that had driven me there was soon told, and after a consultation between the two, it was agreed that, beyond all doubt, I might compromise my own life and the security of my family by remaining in France. How far they were right! would have been difficult to determine, even had my mind been in a state to have examined the question. The privileges of the nobility were great, but not such as to have secured my immunity, if it could have been proved that the homicide had been intentional. Nothing remained for me, according to their showing, but once more to try the air of Spain, till such time as my pardon could be obtained, which might, indeed, be long, for it had lately been the policy of the Prime Minister to strike every possible blow at the power of the nobility, and to show less lenity towards any member of their body than to those of the common classes. Little did I heed their reasoning on the subject. The conclusion was all that reached my mind, and the idea of there being an absolute necessity of my quitting the country was in itself a relief. Even to think of remaining in those scenes was horror, and to have met Helen's eyes after slaying her brother 
would have been a thousand times worse than death. "'Come, cheer up, Count Louis,' cried Garcias. "'I did not think to see so brave a heart as yours overset by a thing that happens to every one now and then. Give him a horn of La Mancha brandy, Senor Miller. It will comfort his heart, and get rid of such foolish qualms. In the meanwhile, I will go out and see after the body. If no one has come near it, and I can get it down to the river, I will cast it in below the fall. The waters are full, and it may go down for ten or fifteen miles, so that nobody will hear more of it, and the Count may stay in his own land. But if they have discovered the business, our young seigneur must lie here till midnight, and then be off with me into Spain. I shall meet my good fellows in the mountains, and then the douanier, who would stop us, must have iron hands and a brazen face. I let them do with me whatsoever they liked. It seemed that those fine ties which connect the mind to the body were so far broken or relaxed that the sensations of the one had no longer their effect upon the other. My heart was on fire, and my thoughts were as busy as hell could wish, but I scarcely saw or heard or knew what was passing around me, and I let Garcias and the miller manage me as if I had been an automaton, without exerting any volition of my own. I drank the raw spirit that the miller gave me, and indeed it might as well have been water. I suffered him, when Garcias was gone, to pour on his consolations, which fell cold and heavy upon my ear, but found not their way to my heart. Nor, indeed, did he seem to understand the cause of that despairing melancholy in which I was plunged, attributing my grief to fear, or the consequences, or to dislike to quit my country. I had not the spirit even to repel such a supposition, although my feelings were very, very different. The absorbing consciousness of guilt prevented me at first from even remembering or thinking of the impassable barrier now placed between me and Helen. That was an afterthought, infinitely painful, it is true, but it came not at once. The only thought which occupied me, if indeed thought it can be called, was the mental endeavour to qualify the bitterness of my feelings by remembering that the act which had so suddenly plunged me into misery was not a voluntary one, and I had continually to reiterate, to press upon my own mind, that it was accidental, and to call up the memory of every painful circumstance in order to assure myself that I was practising no self-deception. Then, too, came the consciousness that I had pointed the gun, and a thousand times I asked myself what would have been my conduct had I not stumbled over the rock. Would I have fired? Would I have refrained? I know not, and still my own heart condemned and branded me with the name of murderer. It seemed long, long ere Garcia came back, for to those who despair, as well as to those who hope, each minute lingers out an age. When he came, he brought the news that the body had been removed before he had arrived at the spot, and that by creeping on behind the trees, he had caught a glimpse of the persons that bore it, who were evidently proceeding towards the chateau. As he spoke, I covered my eyes with my hands, as if to shut out the view of Helen's first sight of her brother's corpse. She had fled so fast at the sound of footsteps that she could not have known who it was had approached, but now she would see him, bleeding from a wound by my hand, and by the place where he was found she would easily divine who was the murderer. It wanted but that thought to work up my agony to the highest pitch, and it burst forth in a torrent of passionate tears. "'Fie, fie!' cried Garcias. "'Senor, are you a man? I would not, for very shame, have any one see you look so womanly. You have slain a man. Good, had you not good cause? Were he alive again, and were to offer you a blow, would you not slay him again? If you would not, you are yourself unworthy to live, for the man that outlives his honour is a disgrace to existence. A man once told me I lied, continued the smuggler, advancing and laying his gigantic hand upon my arm, to call my attention while the dark fire flashed out of his eyes, as if his heart still flamed at the insult. He told me I lied. We were sitting in a peaceful circle upon the green top of the first step of the Maladetta, where it juts out over the plain, with a precipice two hundred feet high. He told me I lied in the presence of the girl I loved. He told me I lied. 
and I pitched him as far into the open air as I have seen a hurler cast a disc. I can see him now, sprawling midway between heaven and earth, till he fell dashed to atoms on the rocks below. And think you that I give it one vain regret, one weak womanish thought? Did he and I stand there again, with the same provocation? I would send him again as far, ay, farther were it possible. Come, come, he added, no more of this. Miller, give him another cup of consolation. The smuggler took, perhaps, the best way of teaching me to bear the weight of what I had done, by showing me that there were others who walked under it so lightly. Wondering at his coolness, yet envying it, I took another and another cup of the spirit, till I began to find some relief, and could look around me, and gain some knowledge of the external objects. It was then I perceived the reason why the miller had been so slow in admitting us. The whole place was strewed with various contraband goods, which had not yet been deposited in their usual receptacle, which was apparently an under-chamber, reached by a trap-door in the floor of the mill, so artfully contrived that it had escaped even my eyes in my frequent visits to the place. It now stood open, and no sooner did Garcias perceive that the brandy and his conversation had produced some effect upon me, then pointing to a low bed in one corner, he advised me to lie down and go to sleep, while he helped the miller to conceal the salt and other prohibited articles with which the floor was encumbered. I said I could not sleep, and he made me take a fourth cup of brandy, which soon plunged me at least into forgetfulness. How long I lay, I know not, but when I woke, the interior of the mill was quite dark, except where a moonbeam streamed in through a high window, and fell upon the dark gigantic figure of Garcias, standing with the miller near the door, apparently in the act of listening. At the same time a high pile of salt moved to the edge of the trap-door, but not yet let down, proved that the smugglers had been interrupted in their employment. In an instant a tremendous knocking, which had probably been the cause of my waking, was repeated against the mill-door, and a voice was heard crying, if you do not open the door, take the consequences, for I give you notice that I shall break it open. I am François Derville, officer of His Majesty's Douane, and I charge you to yield me entrance. Ay, I know you well, muttered Garcia to himself, and a bold fellow you are too. See, Miller, by the loophole, he continued in the same undertone, see whether there is any one with him. The miller climbed up to a small aperture high in the wall, which apparently commanded a view of the door, and after looking through it for a moment, while the blows were reiterated on the outside, he descended, saying, He is alone. I have looked all up the valley, and no one is near him, but I see he has got an iron crow to break open the door. He will not try that when he knows I am here, said Garcias, and elevating his voice to a tone which drowned the knocking without, he added, Hold, Derville, hold! I am here, Pedro Garcias, you know me, and you know I am not one to be disturbed. So go away about your business, if you would not have worse come of it. Pedro Garcias, or Pedro Devil, replied the man without, what matters it to me? I will do my duty. Therefore let me in, or I will break open the door. And a heavy blow of his crow confirmed this expression of his intention. The man is mad, said Garcias, with that calm, cold tone, which very often in men of stormy passions announces a more deadly degree of wrath than when their anger exhausts itself in noisy fury. The man is mad, and stooping down, he took up one of the heavy wooden mallets with which he had been breaking the salt. In the meanwhile, the blows without were redoubled, and the door evidently began to give way. "'Take care of what you are doing!' cried Garcias in a voice of thunder. "'You are rushing into the lion's den!' Another and another blow were instantly struck. The door staggered open, and the douaniers stood full in the portal. Garcias raised his arm, the mallet fell, and the unhappy officer rolled upon the floor with his skull dashed to atoms, like an ox before the blow of the butcher. He made no cry or sound except a sort of inarticulate moan, but fell dead at once without a struggle. "'Good God, what have you done?' cried I, starting from the bed where I had hitherto lain, and approaching Garcias. 
punished a villain for breaking the law of every civilized land replied the smuggler for no country authorizes one man to infringe the dwelling of another without authority and he had no authority or he would have shown it at least he added in a lighter tone though perhaps what he did add proceeded from a more serious feeling for that dark and wily thing the human heart thus often covers itself even from ourselves with a disguise the most opposite to its native character at least i hope he had none at all events he knew well what he was about i warned him beforehand and now i think he will never break into any one's house again shut the door miller and let us have light the coolness with which he contemplated the body of his victim produced very strange and perhaps evil impressions in my breast certainly in that small silent court of justice which every man holds within his own breast both upon his and upon other people's actions i condemned the deed i had seen committed and i found myself too guilty but his crime seemed so much more enormous than mine that the partial judge was willing i am afraid to pardon the minor offender but it was the example of his calmness that had strongest effect upon me and i began to value human life at less since i saw it estimated so low by others neither garcias nor the miller seemed to give one thought of remorse to the deed the miller speaking of it in his cool placid manner and garcias treating it as one of those matters which every man was called to perform at some time of his life both of them also justified it to themselves as an act of absolute necessity for their own security to what crime to what folly has not that plea of necessity pandered at one time or another in this world from the statesman to the pick-purse from the warrior to the cut-throat all all shield themselves behind necessity from the arrows which conscience vainly aims at the rebellious heart of man the question now became how to dispose of the body but the smuggler soon arranged his plan with an art in concealing such deeds which though doubtless gained in the wild hazardous traffic he carried on i own made me shudder with associations i liked not to dwell upon without any apparent reluctance he raised the corpse in his arms and carried it out to a crag that overhung the stream having an elevation of about a hundred yards perpendicular underneath this point were several masses of rock and stone a fall on which would infallibly have produced death with much the same appearances as those to be found on the body of the douanier but without trusting to this garcias carried the body to the top of the rock and cast it down headlong upon the stones below which it spattered with its blood and brains and then rolling over into the river was carried away with the stream the next thing was to cast down the iron crow which might have been supposed to drop from his hand in falling and then the smuggler broke away a part of the mould and turf that covered the top of the rock leaving such an appearance as the spot would have presented had the ground given way under the officer's feet all this being done he returned to the mill and telling me that it would soon be time for us to set out he applied himself to concluding the work in which he had been disturbed by the arrival of the douanier as calmly as if the fearful transactions of the last half hour had left no impress upon his memory the only thing that might perchance betray any regret or remorse was the dead silence with which he proceeded as if his thoughts were deeply occupied with some engrossing subject at length however he turned to the miller come give me a horn of aguardente cried he with a sigh that commented on his demand and stow away those two lumps of salt yourself have you put the door to rights it will tell tales to-morrow if you do not take heed and wipe up that blood upon the floor so saying he cast his gigantic limbs upon the seat mused a moment or two with a frowning brow and i thought i could see that he strove to summon up again in his bosom the angry feelings under which he had slain his fellow-creature to counterbalance the regret that was gaining mastery over his heart his lips curled and his eye flashed and tossing off the cup of spirits which the miller proffered he cast his mantle across his shoulders and prepared to set out 
had he shown no touch of remorse there would have existed no link of association between his feelings and mine but i saw that though his heart had been hardened in scenes of danger and guilt it was still accessible to some better sensations there was also a similarity in the events which had that day happened to us both that created a degree of sympathy between us and i rose willingly to accompany the smuggler when he announced that he was ready to depart to my surprise however he turned not towards the door by which we had entered but going into a small sort of closet in which appeared a variety of sacks and measures and other accessories of a miller's trade he bade me do precisely as he did for my part i saw no means of exit from that place but i found that there were more secrets in the mill than i had dreamed of choosing out a large spare millstone that lay upon the floor of the closet garcias mounted thereon and dropped his arms by his sides when instantly the stone began to sink under his weight and he disappeared by degrees like some gigantic genius in a fairy tale the miller handed him a lantern the moment he had descended sufficiently to be clear of the hole through which the stone had sunk he then jumped off the millstone which rose rapidly in its place counterbalanced by some other weight and on my stepping upon it it again descended with me and i found myself in a sort of cave whether artificial or natural i know not but which ran some way into the rock under the mill the miller followed with a key and a gourd fashioned into a bottle which he bestowed upon me and which i afterwards found to be full of brandy he then opened a small door which gave us egress close to the water-wheel and bidding him farewell we issued forth and in a moment stood in the moonlight by the side of the river End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen. With a quick step, Garcias led the way towards that side of the hill which from its position was cast into shadow, and taking an upward path that we both knew, he soon arrived in those high and lonely parts of the mountain where solitude and silence reigned undisturbed high above earth's habitations nothing looked upon us but the clear blue sky and the bright calm moon whose beams fell soft and silvery upon the tall mountain peaks around poured into every valley danced in every stream and contrasted the broad deep shadows thrown by each projecting rock with the bright effulgence of those spots whereon she glowed with her full power it was a grand and solemn scene and there was something inexpressibly awful in the calm sublime aspect of the giant world in which we stood in the silence in the moonlight in the deep clear expanse of the profound blue sky especially when each of those who contemplated it had heavy on his heart the weight of human blood it felt as if we were more immediately in the presence of heaven itself as if the calm bright eye of eternal justice looked sternly into the deepest recesses of our bosoms garcia seemed to feel nearly as much as i did and bending his eyes upon the ground he pursued his way silently and fast till descending for some hundred yards and turning the angle of the hill we came under a group of high trees which formed a beautiful object on the mountain side when viewed from the windows of the chateau de l'orme and from which i could now discern the dwelling of my ancestors here the smugglers stopped as if to allow me a last view of the scenes of my infancy and my eye instantly running down the valley rested on the grey towers and pinnacles of my paternal mansion with a lingering regret impossible to describe there lay all that i loved on earth the objects of every better affection of my nature there lay the scenes amongst which every happier hour had passed there lay the spot where every early dream had been formed where hope had arisen where every wish returned and i was leaving it leaving it perhaps for ever with a stain upon my name and the kindred blood of her most dear upon my hand my heart swelled as if it would have burst my brain burned as with fire 
and my eyes would fain have wept. I struggled long to prevent them, and I should have succeeded, but just while I was gazing, while a thousand overpowering remembrances and bitter regrets seemed tearing my heart to pieces, a nightingale broke out in the trees above my head, and poured forth so wild, so sweet, so melancholy a song, that my excited feelings would bear no more, and the tears rolled over my cheeks like the large drops of a thunderstorm. "'Poor boy,' said Garcias, "'I am sorry for thee. I can feel now, more than I could this morning, what thou feelest, for, in truth, I would that I had not slain that Derville so rashly, and I know not why, but I wish what I never wished before, that the moon was not so bright.' It seems as if that poor wretch were looking at me. But come, tis no use to think of these things. When we are in Spain, we will get us absolution, and that is all that we can do. Pardon me, monsieur, he added, suddenly resuming that peculiar sort of haughtiness which leads many a proud man in an inferior station to give a full portion of ceremonious deference to his superior. Pardon me, if now or in future I treat you too like a companion of pedro garcias the smuggler during this day my wish to check your grief has made me unceremonious and till you can return perhaps you had better waive that respect which your rank entitles you to require for it may not please you hereafter to have many of those with whom you now consort for a time boast of having been your very good friends and fellow adventurers i told him to call me what he liked and to use his own discretion in regard to what account he gave of me to those whose companion I was about to become. Little, indeed, cared I for any part of the future. It had nothing for hope to fix upon, and once having withdrawn my eyes from that valley and turned upon the path before me, I was reckless about all the rest. It seemed, however, that Garcias had found a relief in breaking the dead silence which had hung upon us so long for he continued speaking on various topics as we went, and gradually succeeded in drawing my mind from the actual objects of my regret. Not that I forgot my grief, far from it. It still lay a dead and heavy weight upon my heart, but my thoughts did not continue to trace every painful remembrance with the agonizing minuteness which they had lately done. Such is ever the first effect of that balm which time pours into every wound, it scarcely seems to lessen the anguish but it renders it less defined gradually i listened and replied and though each minute or two my mind reverted to myself yet the intervals became longer and i found it every time more easy than the last to abstract my thoughts from my own situation and to apply them to the subjects on which he spoke for more than two hours we continued walking on till we arrived at the heights nearly opposite to Argeles, during which time we had climbed the hills and descended into the valleys more than once we were now again upon the very crest of the mountain and the moon was just sinking behind the hills to the west of the balindral when garcias paused and pointed down the course of the stream that burst precipitately over the side of the hill with so perpendicular a fall that it almost deserved the name of a cataract the body of water though then but a rivulet was at some part of the year undoubtedly considerable, for it had channelled for itself a deep ravine, which for some space wound away from the valley, as if obstinately resolved to bear its tribute in any other direction than towards the principal river that flowed in the midst. But after pursuing these capricious meanderings for a considerable way, it was obliged at length to follow the direction of the hills, and turn towards the valley in its own despite, as we often see, in some far province, a stubborn contender of established authorities, pursue for a while his own wilful way, fancying himself a man of great spirit and an independent soul, till comes some stiff official of the law who turns him sneaking back into the common course of life. The bottom of the ravine, left free by the shrinking of the stream, was lined on either hand with the most luxuriant verdure, and overhung by a thousand shrubs and trees now in their ruffling dresses of summer green where we then stood however many hundred yards above with the moon as i have said sinking behind the opposite mountains all that i could see was a dark and fearful chasm below 
at the bottom of which I caught every now and then the flash and sparkle of the stream, whose roar, as it broke from fall to fall, reached my ear even at that height. Down this abyss Garcias pointed, saying that our journey's end lay there, for the present. If you are a true mountaineer, added he, you will be able to follow me, but attempt it not if you feel the least fear, for I have seldom seen a place more likely to break the neck of any but a good cragsman. Go on, replied I, I have no fear, and indeed I had become so reckless about life that had it been the jaws of hell I would have plunged in, and yet it appeared I was even then in the act of flying from death. Man is so made up of inconsistencies that this would not have been extraordinary, granting it to have been the case. But it was not so. I was not flying from death, but from ignominy and shame, and the reproachful eyes of those I loved. Garcias led the way, and certainly never did a more hazardous and precarious path receive the steps of two human beings. Its course lay down the very face of the precipice over which the stream fell, and the only tenable steps that it afforded were formed by the broken faces of the schistous rock, without one bough of shrub or tree, to offer a hold for the hands. The river at the same time kept roaring in our ears, within a yard of our course, and every now and then, where it took a more furious bound than ordinary, it dashed its spray in our faces, and over our path, confusing the sight, whose range was already circumscribed by the darkness, and rendering the rock so slippy that nothing but the talons of an eagle would have fastened steadily upon it. At length we came to a spot of smooth turf, with still the same degree of perpendicular declination, and to keep one's feet became now almost impossible, so that nothing seemed left but to lie down and slip from the top to the bottom. It was a dangerous experiment, for the descent might probably have terminated in a precipice which would have been difficult to avoid. But I little cared, and with the usual success of boldness, I lighted on a small round plot of turf, crowning another turn of the ravine. A man anxious for life would most probably have avoided the course of the stream, slipped past the spot on which I found a safe resting place, and been dashed over the precipice which lay scarce two yards from me. In a moment Garcias was by my side, and asked with some concern, lest his place of retreat had been discovered, whether I had ever visited that spot before, for I seemed to know it, he said, as well as he did himself. Having assured him I never had, and that my fortunate descent was entirely accidental, he laid his hand on my arm as if to stay me from any farther trial of the kind. "'You have escaped strangely,' said he, but never make the same experiment again, unless you are something more than merely careless about life. We are now close upon my men, he added, and we must give them notice of our approach, or we may risk a shot. And he stooped over the edge of the cliff, looking down into the ravine. It was here that the trees and shrubs which lined thickly the lower parts of the dell first began to sprout, and forming a dark screen between our eyes and the course of the stream, they would have cut off all view of what was passing below, had it been day. But at that hour, when all was darkness around us, and no glare of sunshine outshone any other light, we could just catch through the foliage the sparkling of a fire about forty yards below us, and as we gazed a very musical voice broke out in a Spanish song. Being directly above the singer, the sounds rose distinctly to our ears, so that we could very well distinguish the words that he sang which were to the following tenor, as near as I can recollect. Song Tread thou the mountain, brother, brother, tread thou the mountain wild. In each other land men betray one another, be thou then the mountain's child. Hark! How Hidalgo to Hidalgo vows, to serve him he'd hazard his life. But woe to the foolish and confident spouse, if he leave him alone with his wife. Tread then the mountain, brother, brother, tread then the mountain wild. In each other land men betray one another, be thou then the mountain's child. Lo how the merchant to merchant will say, his credit and purse to command. 
but let him fall bankrupt i doubt well a day no credits he'll have at his hand tread then the mountain brother brother tread then the mountain wild in each other land men betray one another be thou then the mountain's child lo how the statesman will promise his tool to raise him to honour some day but when he's done all he would wish the poor fool will regret taking fine words for pay tread then the mountain brother brother tread then the mountain wild in each other land men betray one another be thou then the mountain's child hark what the courtier vows to his king to serve him whatever befall but if evil luck dark misfortune should bring the courtier turns sooner than all tread then the mountain brother brother tread then the mountain wild in court crowd and city men cheat one another be thou then the mountain's child he says true by saint jago he says true cried garcias who had been listening as well as myself thank god for being born a mountaineer he ended his self-gratulation with a long whistle so shrill that it reached the ears of the singer to whom the noise of our voices had not arrived from the height we were above him although his song by the natural tendency of sounds had come up to us he answered the signal of his captain immediately and we instantly began to descend making steps of the boles and roots of the trees till lighting once more on somewhat level ground we stood beside his watch-fire the singer was a tall fine aragonese about my own age or perhaps somewhat older who had been thrown out as a sentinel to guard the little encampment of the smugglers which lay a couple of hundred yards farther down the ravine he bore a striking resemblance to garcias whom he called cousin and also seemed to possess some portion of his gigantic strength if one might judge by the swelling muscles of his legs and arms which were easily discernible through the tight netted silk breeches and stockings he wore in common with most of his companions he gazed upon me for a moment or two with some surprise and i returned his look with one of equal curiosity in truth i should not particularly have liked to encounter him as an adversary for with his long gun his knife and his pistols added to the vigour and activity indicated by his figure he would have offered as formidable an opponent as i ever beheld no questions however did he ask concerning me not a word not an observation did he make but resuming the characteristic gravity of the spaniard from which perhaps he thought his song might have somewhat derogated in the eyes of a stranger he merely replied to a question of his cousin that all had passed tranquilly during his absence and cast himself down upon his chequered cloak by the side of the watch-fire with an air of the most perfect indifference at another time i might have smiled to see how true it is that nations have their affectations as well as individuals but i was in no smiling mood and were i to own the truth i turned away with a feeling of contemptuous anger at his arrogation of gravity fully as ridiculous in me as even his mock solemnity what had i to do to be angry with him i asked myself after a moment's reflection i was not born to be the whipper of all fools and if i was i thought my castigation had certainly better begin with myself garcias led me on to the rest of his companions who were stretched sleeping on the ground some wrapped in their cloaks some partly sheltered from the winds which in those mountains lose not their wintry sharpness till summer is far advanced by little stone walls built up from the various masses of rock that from time to time had rolled down the mountain and strewed the bottom of the ravine the younger men though engaged in a life of danger and risk slept on with the fearless slumber of youth but four or five of the elder smugglers whom ancient habits of watchful anxiety rendered light of sleep started up with musket and dagger in their hands long before our steps had reached their halting place the figure of garcias however soon quieted their alarm and i was astonished to see how little agitation the return of their absent leader from what had been and always must be a dangerous part of their enterprise caused amongst them nor did my presence excite any particular attention garcias informed them simply that i was a friend he had long known and now came to join them 
on which they welcomed me cordially without further inquiry giving me merely their buenas noches tenga usted caballero and assigning me a spot to sleep in near the horses which was indeed the place of honour being more sheltered than any other End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen sleep calm natural sleep was not however to be procured so soon and though i laid down and remained quiet in imitation of the smugglers what what would i not have given for the slumber they enjoyed i need not go farther into my feelings i need not tell all the bitter and agonizing reflections that reiterated themselves upon my brain till i thought reason would have abandoned me what i had been what i was what i was to be each one of them had some peculiar pang so that on neither the past the present nor the future could my mind rest without torture and yet i could not sleep it may easily be conceived then that the two hours which elapsed between our arrival at the rendezvous and the break of day was a space too dreadful to be rested on without pain even now when the whole has been given over to the more calm dominion of remembrance remembrance that has the power to rob every part of the past of its bitter except remorse and to mingle some sweet with even the memory of pain and misfortune provided our own heart finds nothing therein for reproach as soon as the very first faint streaks of light began to interweave themselves with the grey clouds in the east the smugglers were upon their feet and gathering round garcias and myself began to ask a great many more questions than they had ventured on the night before my dress and my person became objects of some curiosity among them and it so unfortunately happened that more than one of the smugglers who had seen me at the mill in former days instantly recognized me at present however as probably no one of them would have found it agreeable himself to assign his exact reasons for joining the lawless band with which he consorted i escaped all questions as to the cause of my appearing amongst them each probably attributed it to some separate imagination of his own but the high favour in which our house stood with this honourable fraternity assured me the most enthusiastic reception and they mutually rivalled one another in their endeavours to serve me and render my situation comfortable it was in vain now to attempt concealing from any one of the band my rank in life but in order that accident should not extend my real name beyond the mere circle of those who knew me i followed a custom which i found they generally adopted themselves that of distinguishing themselves each by a different appellation when actually engaged in any of their hazardous enterprises from that by which they were ordinarily known in the world i therefore took the name of de lorme to which i was really entitled by birth the comte de lorme having been in our family from time immemorial these arrangements the quick questions of the smugglers their wild strange manners and picturesque appearance all formed a relief to a mind anxious to escape from itself and perhaps no society into which i could have fallen would have afforded me so much the means of abstracting my thoughts from all that was painful in my situation after having satisfied their curiosity in regard to me the spaniards to the number of twenty gathered round garcias to hear how he had disposed of the smuggled goods which had been deposited at the mill and certainly never did a more picturesque group meet my view than that which they presented with their fine muscular limbs rich coloured dresses deep sunburnt countenances and flashing black eyes while each cast himself into some of those wild and picturesque attitudes which seem natural to mountaineers and the form of garcias towering above them all looked like that of the farnesian hercules fresh from the garden of hesperides garcias's story was soon told he informed them simply that all was safe produced the little bag which contained the profits of their last adventure and told them how much the miller expected to gain for the goods at present in his hands 
I remarked, however, he wisely said not a word of the death of Derville, the douanier, although undoubtedly it would have met with the high approbation of his companions, and probably would have given him still greater sway than even that which he already possessed over the minds of a class of men on whom anything striking and bold is never without its effect. All this being concluded, instant preparation was made for our departure. A horse was assigned to me from amongst those which had borne the smuggled wares across the mountains, and all the worthy fraternity being mounted, we had already begun to wind down the ravine in an opposite direction from that on which Garcias and myself had arrived, when the sound of voices, heard at a little distance before us, made us halt in our march. In a moment after, one of the smugglers, who had been sent out as a sort of piquette in front, and whose voice we had heard, returned, dragging along a poor little man, in whom I instantly recognised the unfortunate player apothecary, who had given me so much relief by his chicurgial applications a day or two before. He had a small bundle strapped upon his back as if equipped for travelling, and seemed to be in mortal fear, holding back with all his might, while the smuggler pulled him along by the arm, as we have often seen a boy drag on an unwilling puppy by the collar, while the obstinate beast hangs back with its haunches, and sets its four feet firmly forward, contending stoutly with every step that it is forced to make in advance. "'He is a spy!' cried the smuggler, pulling his prisoner forward into the midst of the wild group that our halt had occasioned. "'I caught him dodging about in the bushes there, at the entrance of the ravine, and depend on it, the gabayateurs are not far off.' The poor player, who understood not one word of this Spanish accusation, gazed about with open mouth and starting eyes upon the dark countenances of the smugglers, who, I believe, were only meditating whether it would be better to throw him over the first precipice or hang him up to the first tree, and whose looks, in consequence, did not offer anything reassuring. Monsieur, monsieur, respectable monsieur cried he, gazing round and round in an agony of terror, without being able to say any more, when suddenly his eye fell upon me, and darting forward with a quick spring, that loosed him from the smuggler's hold, he cast himself upon his knees, embracing my stirrup, while half a dozen guns were instantly pointed at his head, from the idea that he was about to make his escape. The clicking of the gun-locks increased his terror almost to madness, and, creeping under my horse's belly, he made a sort of shield for his head, with my foot and the large clumsy stirrup iron, crying out with the most doleful accents, "'Don't fire! Don't fire! Pray don't fire! Monsignor, illustrious scion of a noble house, pray don't fire! Exert thine influence benign for the preservation of a lowly supplicant!' By this time one of the smugglers had again got the player by the collar, and dragging him out with some detriment to his doublet, he placed him once more in the midst. Garcias, cried I, seeing them rather inclined to maltreat their captive, do not let them hurt him. Your companion is under a mistake. This poor little wretch, depend on it, had no more idea of spying upon your proceedings than he had of spying into the intrigues of the moon. He is a miserable player, who is unemployed and half-starving, I believe. I will answer for his being no spy. At my intercession, Garcias interfered to prevent any further annoyance being inflicted upon the hero of the buskin, and questioned him in French in regard to what he did there. For a moment or two, his terror and agitation deprived him of the power of explaining himself, but soon beginning to perceive that the storm had in some degree subsided, he took courage and summoning up his most elevated style, he proceeded to explain his appearance amongst them, mingling, as he went on, a slight degree of satire with his bombast, which I was afraid might do him but little service with his hearers. "'Gentlemen,' cried he, "'if ye be, as from your gay attire and splendid arms, your noble bearing and your bronze cheats, I judge you are, lords of the forest and the mountain, night wanderers of the wild, magistrates executors of your own laws and abrogators of the laws of every other person 
I beseech ye, show pity and fellow feeling towards one who has the honour of being fully as penniless as yourself, who, though he never yet had courage enough to cut a purse, or talent enough to steal one, has ever been a great admirer of those bold and witty men who maintain the blessed doctrine of the community of this world's goods at the point of the sword, and put down the villainous monopoly of gold and silver with a strong hand and a loaded pistol. "'Make haste, good friend,' said Garcia, smiling. "'We are not what you take us for, but we have as much need of concealment as if we were. Therefore, if you would escape hanging on that bough, give a true account of yourself in as few words as possible. Such active tongues as yours sometimes slip into the mire of falsehood. See that it be not the case with you. Say, how came you in this unfrequented part of the country at this early hour?' admirable captain cried the player again beginning to tremble for his life you shall hear the strange mysterious turns of fate that conducted me hither to a part of which that noble scion of an illustrious house who seems either to be your prisoner or your friend i know not which but who in either capacity is equally honourable and to be honoured can bear witness know then magnanimous chief no later than yesterday morning towards the hour of noon according to that illustrious scion's express command i proceeded to the principal gate of the mighty chateau de l'orme where i had expected a certain further fee or reward which he promised me for having solaced and assuaged the pains of those wounds still visible upon his brow and hands but judge of my surprise when on entering the courtyard i found the whole place in confusion and dismay men mounting in haste women screaming at leisure dogs barking horses neighing and asses braying and on my addressing myself to an elderly gentleman with a long nose for all the world like a sausage of bigot asking him with a sweet respectful smile if he could show me to my lord the young count he bestowed a buffet on my cheek which has even a greater effect than the buffet which moses gave the rock for it brought fire as well as water out of my eyes both at once and what was the cause of all this tumult did you hear demanded garcias who had observed my eye while the player told what he had seen at the chateau de l'orme straining up his countenance with an anxiety that would bear no delay to speak the truth most mighty potentate of the mountains replied the stroller i asked no farther questions where such answers seemed amongst the most common forms of speech i thought the striking reply of my first respondent quite sufficient though not very satisfactory and judging he might like my back better than my face i got my heels over the threshold and came away as fast as possible i did not return to the cottage where i had spent the last six weeks for i had happily my pack on my back and my worthy host and hostess were so much obliged to me for boarding and lodging with them all that time that i doubt they would have retained my goods and chattels as a keepsake if i had ventured myself within reach of their affectionate embraces though god help me they had already kept as a remembrance the gold piece which monseigneur gave me at first i last night made my way to argelès and liberally offered the gross-minded aubergiste of the place to treat himself and his company to the whole of the seed to be enacted by myself alone for the simple consideration of a night's lodging and a dinner but he most grovelling brute fingered my doublet with his cursed paw and said he was afraid the dresses and decorations would be too expensive as they must evidently all be new indignantly i turned upon my heel and walked on till i came to this valley where i found a nice warm bush and slept out my night after father adam's fashion this morning hearing voices and knowing not whence they came i began to look about with some degree of caution when suddenly pounces upon me this dark-browed gentleman and drags me hither to the manifest injury of my poor doublet which god help it has had so many a pull from old mischievous time that it can ill bear the rude touch of any other fingers this is my tale renowned sir and if it be not true may the buskin never fit my foot may the dagger break in my grasp and my bowl tumble out of my fingers the latter part of the poor player's speech had been sufficiently long to give me the time necessary for recovering from the effect of that portion of it which had personally affected myself 
and I pointed out to Garcias that his tale must undoubtedly be true, begging him at the same time to free the poor little man and send him away. No, no, replied the smuggler, that must not be. He has found his way to a retreat which none but ourselves knew. Such secrets are heavy things to carry, and he might drop his burden at some douanier's door who would pay for it in gold. No, no, willing or unwilling, he must come with us to Spain, and we will teach him a better trade than ranting other people's nonsense to amuse as great fools as himself. The little player at first seemed somewhat astounded at such an unexpected alteration in his prospects, but learning that, in the very first place, board and lodging was to be provided for him, and a horse as soon as one could be procured, his countenance brightened up, and he trudged contentedly after the band of smugglers, eating a large lump of cheese and a biscuit, which Garcias had given him as occupation on the road. Strange, strange world, where the most abject poverty is the surest buckler against misfortune. When I stood and considered that wretched player's feelings and my own, and saw how little he was affected by things which would have pained me to the very soul, how little he heeded being torn from his native land, with nothing but blank uncertainty before him, and how he enjoyed the crust which fortune had given him. I could hardly help envying his very misery, which so armoured him against all the shafts of adversary to which I stood nakedly opposed. My present journey through the Pyrenees, though tending very nearly in the same direction as the first, lay amongst scenes of still wilder description, for the smugglers, carefully avoiding all the ordinary paths, and though now unburdened with any seizable goods, as heedfully guarded against a meeting with the officers of the douane as if they were escorting a whole cargo. They seemed to take a delight in the mystery and secrecy of their ways, but in truth they found it necessary to keep the whole world, except those concerned, in perfect ignorance of the great extent to which their contraband traffic was carried on, and for this purpose, glided along through the deepest shades of the pine forests and over the highest and least frequented parts of the hills by paths impracticable to any but themselves towards the close of the first day we halted by the side of a small mountain lake whose calm still shadowy waves i almost hoped were the waters of oblivion round about the mountains rose up on every side seeming to shelter it from the world and not a breath of wind rippled the surface of the water, so that the reflections of the high snowy peaks of the hills above, the dark rocks that dipped themselves in its waves, and the gloomy pines that skirted it to the east, were all seen looking up like ghosts from below, while ever and anon a light evening cloud skimming over the sky found there its reflection too, and was seen gliding over the bosom of the calm expanse. The turf that spread from the margin of the lake to the bases of the mighty rocks that towered up around was covered with every kind of flower, though at so great an elevation, and the rhododendron in full blossom vied with the beautiful pink saffron, as if striving which should most embellish that favoured spot of green that nature seemed to have fancifully placed there, as a contrast between the cold, dark waters and the stern grey rock. When, after alighting from my horse, I gazed round on the whole scene, and then thought of returning to the world, with its idle bustle, and its thronging pains, and its vain babble, and unbroken discontent, I was tempted to cast it all from me at once, and become a hermit, even there, spending my time in the contemplation of eternity. But the thoughts that thronged upon me during that brief half-hour of solitude, while the smugglers were occupied in making their arrangements for the night, showed me that the gayest scenes of the busy world would still leave me, perhaps, more time for memory than I could wish memory to fill. At length my meditations were disturbed by the approach of the little player, who seemed quite contented with his fate. As he came near, he stretched forth his hand, threw back his head, and was beginning with his usual emphasis to address me as illustrious scion of a noble house, when I stopped him in the midst somewhat peevishly, bidding him drop his high-flown style if he would have me listen to him, and never to use it to me again if he wished not such a reply as had been bestowed upon me by my father's maître d'hôtel. This warning and threat had a very happy effect, 
for he seldom afterwards poured forth any of his rodomontade upon me and when denuded of its frippery his conversation was not without poignancy well sir said he after my rebuff i will treat you to plain prose as you love not the high and metaphorical be it known then unto your worship that our friends with the dark faces have prepared something for dinner and invite you to partake of some excellent bayon ham and some unfortunate young trout that an artful vagabond with an insinuating countenance has seduced out of the protecting bosom of their parent lake and abandoned to the vile appetite of his companions added to this you will find some excellent botargui which you doubtless are aware is manufactured out of the row of the mullet and provokes drinking a propensity that you may satisfy at discretion out of certain skins of wine for that purpose made and provided as my poor dear supposed father used to say who turned me out of his house when i was nine years old i had too little love for my own thoughts to remain any longer alone than i could avoid and rising i followed the little player to a spot where the smugglers had spread out their supper upon nature's table this was the first meal i had seen amongst them and i found that they ate but once a day but to do them all manner of justice when they did apply themselves to satisfy their hunger they amply compensated for their abstinence and as they intended to proceed no farther that night they were not more sparing of their wine than of their other viands gradually as the potent juice of the grape began to warm their veins all spanish reserve wore away and mirth and jocularity succeeded jest and tale and song went round and even garcia seemed to banish every circumstance of the past and to enjoy himself as fully as forgetfully as the rest to what was this owing i asked myself to the wine cup it had taught them forgetfulness it was temporary oblivion it was happiness and i drained it and redrained it to obtain the same blessing for myself strange how one error ever brings on another and thus it is that amendment is still so difficult to those who have done wrong tis not alone that they have to renounce the fault they have once committed but that they have also to struggle against all those which that one brings in its train i drank deep for forgetfulness and certainly amongst the companions into whose society circumstances had thrown me i was not without encouragement the wine they had brought with them was excellent and abundant and when any one began to flag in his potation the rest seemed to cry him on as soldiers encourage one another in a march sometimes it was a story sometimes a jest sometimes a song and of the latter they had more amongst them than i had supposed could be invented on one subject the last that i remember was sung by the same musical youth whom garcias and myself had found acting as sentinel when we joined the smugglers near Arguelles, his single voice gave out the separate verses of the song to a merry spanish air while all the rest joining in at the end raised a deafening din with a very absurd chorus woman first invented wine ere man found out to drink it if otherwise she weren't divine for this we're bound to think it chorus malaga and alicante ceres and la mancha whatever cup she offers man will take it and will thank her cold water's but a sober thing that's only fit for asses but before he had concluded or his companions began roaring again about malaga and alicante my cup fell out of my hand and i slept End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. I believe my sleep would have lasted longer than the night had Garcias not woke me towards daybreak and told me that they were preparing to depart. Amongst the smugglers, every one took care of his own horse, and of course I could not expect to be exempt from the same charge in their wandering republic where the only title to require service oneself was the having shown it to others. I started up, therefore, in order to repair, as much as I could, my negligence of the night before. To my surprise, however, I found that the horse had been already rubbed down and saddled by the little player, 
who having drunk more cautiously than myself had woke early in the morning and after having shown this piece of attention to me was engaged in tricking out for his own use an ass which one of the smugglers had procured from some acquaintance at the foot of the mountain i thanked the little man for his civility when laying his hand upon his heart he professed his pleasure in serving me and begged in humble terms if i had any thought of engaging a servant in the expedition wherein we were both engaged that he might be preferred to that high post the post would certainly be more honourable than profitable my good friend replied i with some very melancholy feelings concerning my own destitute condition for my whole fortune consisted of about thirty louis d'or and a diamond ring the value of which i did not know i must tell you thus much concerning my situation i added i am now quitting my father's house and my native land from circumstances which concern me alone but which may render my absence long and during that absence i expect no supply or pecuniary aid from any one you may now judge i proceeded with somewhat of a painful smile whether such a man's service be the one to suit you exactly replied the little player to my surprise for during the time you have nothing to give me you will judge whether i am like to suit you when you can pay me well i ask no wages but meat and drink that i am sure you will give me while you can get any for yourself and if a time should come when you can get none perhaps it may be my turn to put my hand in my fortune's bag and pull out a dinner alone and with no one to help me i have never wanted food but that one day at Argelès and god knows i never knew from day to day where i should fill my cup or load my platter but in company with your lordship never fear we shall always find plenty two people can accomplish a thousand things that one cannot you can do a thousand that i do not know how to do and i can do a thousand that you would be ashamed to do thank god for having been turned out upon the world at nine years old without a sou in my pocket "'Twas the best school in nature for finishing my education. "'I was hurt, I own, at the sort of companionship "'which the miserable little player seemed to have established in his own mind, "'so completely between himself and me. "'And the haughty noble was rising with some acrimony to my lips, "'when I suddenly bethought me what a thing I was to be proud over my fellow worm. "'It was a thought to take down the high stomach of my nobility, "'and after a moment's pause I merely replied, your life must afford a curious history and doubtless has been both full of turns of fate and turns of ingenuity oh it is a very simple history answered the player as brief as the courtship of a widow when your lordship has got on horseback and i have clambered on my ass i will tell it to you as we go along twill at least spend a long five minutes his proposal was not disagreeable to me for my mind was in that state when anything which could fill up a moment with some external feeling or interest was in itself a blessing had he told such a tale as those with which they amused children in a nursery i should have been contented and accordingly as soon after having mounted as we were once more on our journey i begged he would proceed which he complied with as follows my mother's husband who had the credit if any honour was thereunto attached of being my father was when i can first remember him intendant to the estates of monsieur le comte de bagnole he had originally studied the law but not having money enough to purchase any charge at the bar he was very glad to take the management of a young nobleman's estates who though not indeed careless and extravagant was still young consequently inexperienced consequently plunderable and consequently a hopeful speculation for one in my father's situation the count was liberal and therefore the appointments were in themselves good consisting of a separate house half a mile from the chateau a considerable glebe of land and a salary of a thousand crowns i must remark here that the intendant was the ugliest man in christendom but he had the advantage of possessing in my poor dear mother a very handsome wife whose beauties he considered as a certain means of performing the curious alchemical process of the transmutation of metals, that is to say, the changing his own brass into the Count's gold. 
now i should be most happy could i claim any kindred with the noble family of bagnol but sorry i am to say i was several years old when the young count returned to the chateau from his campaigns with the army nor indeed should i have been much better off had fortune decreed me to be born afterwards for though the worthy intendant was as liberal as cato in many respects and the most decided foe to all sorts of jealousy and though my mother also was a complete prodigal in the dispensation of her smiles the count was as cold as ice indeed as his marriage with the beautiful henriette de verne was soon after brought on the carpet i can hardly blame him for thinking of no one else all went on well for two years during which time my mother had twice occasion to call upon lucina and the intendant was gratified by finding himself the father of two other sturdy children at the end of that time however the marriage of the count was broken off with mademoiselle de verne and the young lady was promised to the marquis de st brie you have heard all that sad story i dare say the marquis was not liking a rival at liberty for they began to whisper that the count still privately saw mademoiselle de verne and some even said he was married to her had him arrested and thrown into prison on the accusation of aiding the rebels at rochelle the count however found means to write to the intendant a letter from the bastille containing two orders one was to send him instantly a certain packet of papers containing the proofs of his innocence the other to sell as speedily as possible all the alienable part of his property and to transmit the amount to a commercial house at saragossa the worthy intendant set himself to consider his own interests and finding that it would be best to keep his lord in prison he could never discover the papers at the same time the buying and selling of a large property is never without its advantage to the steward and therefore he punctually obeyed the count's command in this particular selling all that he could sell and transmitting the money to spain at the end of which transaction he found himself very comfortably off in the world one night while he sat counting his gains however he was somewhat surprised by a visit from the count who had made his escape from the bastille and came to make his intendant a call much more disagreeable than interesting so much did the intendant wish his lord at the devil that he was civil to him beyond all precedent and having gone up in the dark to the chateau they spent two hours in diligent search for the papers which they unfortunately could not find for this very good reason the intendant had taken care to remove them three or four days before and had given them in charge to his dear friend and co-labourer the count's apothecary to keep them as a sacred deposit as much out of the count's way as possible after all this sorry to have lost the papers but glad to find he had a considerable fortune placed securely in spain the count set out to seek his fair henriette resolving to carry her to another land and thinking all the while that his intendant was the honestest man in the world under this impression he made him his chief agent in all his plans told him of his private marriage and in short did what very wise men often do let the greatest rogue of his acquaintance into all his most important secrets the marquis de st brise very soon found out the proceedings of his friend the count the count was of course assassinated and thrown into the river the countess was put into a convent where she died in childbirth and god knows what became of the money in spain matters being thus settled to the satisfaction of every one the intendant found he had quite enough money to set up a procureur and went to live in the same town with his dear friend the apothecary but what became of the papers demanded i and why do you always call him the intendant were you a son by some former marriage of your mother be patient be patient monsieur le comte you shall hear replied the little player i was just about to return to my mother with regard to whom a man may feel himself tolerably certain there is a proverb against human presumption in speaking of one's father sage enfant qui canoie son père however my mother was as i have said a very handsome woman and she made use of her advantages but at the same time she was a very superstitious one and though she governed her husband in all domestic matters with a rod of iron 
she suffered herself to be governed by her confessor in all manner still more despotic never used she to fail in her attendance at the confessional and yet i never heard the good priest complain she troubled him unnecessarily at length it so happened that she fell ill and the only thing that could have saved her namely the physicians giving her up having been tried in vain and she being both in the jaws of death and in a great fright her priest would not give her absolution except upon a very hard condition which she executed as follows she sent for her husband and having bade him adieu in very touching terms upon which he wept he could always weep when he liked she sent for his dear friend the apothecary for a worthy goldsmith of the city and for a couple of young gentlemen our neighbours and having brought them all into her bedroom she acknowledged to her husband all her faults and failings comprising many which i in my filial piety will pass over after which she begged his forgiveness and obtained it requested and received in so touching a manner that every one wept she then made her excellent spouse embrace his injurers which he did like a charitable soul and a sensible man with a most solemn and edifying countenance after this she called all her children of which there were by this time four round her and having given us her blessing and her last advice in a very striking and instructive manner she allotted us severally to the care of her friends my next brother she bequeathed to the fatherly protection of the goldsmith my next brother she bequeathed to the fatherly tenderness of the intendant himself though there was an unfortunately small degree of likeness between them i fell to the portion of the apothecary the youngest son was assigned to the protection of the goldsmith and so on when this distribution was concluded she found herself very much exhausted and sending us all away fell into a profound sleep from which she woke the next morning in a fair way for recovery the confessor declared that it was the special interposition of heaven as a reward for her punctual obedience to his commands but her husband thought it the handiwork of the devil on which difference of conclusion i shall not offer an opinion suffice it my mother recovered and finding that the story had got abroad and that every one she met laughed at or avoided her she insisted on her husband changing his abode and carrying her and her family to another town at length however her malady returned upon her after a year's absence and she died for good and all leaving her husband inconsolable for her loss the moment her breath was out of her body the excellent procureur took me to the door of his house and told me tenderly to get along for a graceless little vagabond and none of his go to Al, go to Al, cried he and tell that villain of an apothecary i have sent him his own to Al, i accordingly went and delivered the procurer's message to the apothecary who held up his hands and eyes at the hard heartedness of his former friend and giving me a silver piece of a livre tournois he bade me go along and not trouble him any more the next morning when my livre was spent and i began to grow hungry i naturally turned my steps towards the apothecary's and hung about near his door without daring to enter when suddenly i saw him driving out in fury the boy that carried his medicines who had been guilty i found afterwards of drinking the wine set apart for making antimonial wine and so great was the rage of my worthy parent that he threw both the pestle and the mortar into the street after the culprit having had all my life a sort of instinctive dislike to the society of an angry man i was in the act of gliding away as fast as i could when his eye fell upon me and beckoning me to him he called me to come near in a tone that made me obey instantly come hither cried he come hither now i wager an ounce of kerns to a grain of jalap that thou hast been well taught to thieve and to lie hey is it not so no your worship answered i trembling every limb but i dare say i shall soon learn under your teaching hola thou art malapert cried he but come in out of pure charity i will give thee the place of that thief i have just kicked out but remember it is out of pure charity thou hast no claim on me whatever mark that 
but if thou servest me truly and appliest thyself to my lessons i will make thee a rival to galen and hippocrates thus was i established as medicine boy at my father the apothecary's and having been turned out of my father the procureur's and soon learned his mood and his practice the first was somewhat arbitrary but despotic and after taking care never to contradict him except where he wished to be contradicted i soon ingratiated myself with him to a very high degree his practice also was very simple whenever he was called in to any patient he began by giving them an emetic to clear away all obstructions as he said he next inquired if the complaint was local and where if it was in the head he put a blister on the soles of the feet if it was in the lower extremities he placed one on the crown of the head if it was between the two he took care to blister both when the malady was general he began by bleeding and went on by bleeding till the patient died or recovered declaring all the while that let the disease be as bad as it would he would have it out of him one way or another he had a good deal of practice when i came and it rapidly increased for he was always called in by poor dependents who expected legacies to their rich relatives by young heirs of estates to old annuitants by the expectants of abbeys and persons possessing survivorships to their dear friends the long-lived incumbents and he was also applied to frequently by young wives for their old husbands and other cases of the kind wherein he was supposed to practise very successfully as i grew up he initiated me into all the secrets of his profession took me to the bedside of his patients and in fact gave me many a paternal mark of his regard nor did he confine his confidence in me entirely to professional subjects it was from him that i learned the earlier part of my own history and that of the count of bagnol whose papers i had many an opportunity of seeing for they lay wrapped in a piece of old sheepskin in a drawer with the syringes thus passed the time till a company of players visited alp and as every night of their performance i went to see them i speedily acquired a taste i may say a passion for the stage which evidently showed that nature had destined me to wear the buskin from that moment i was seized with horror at the indiscriminate slaughter which i daily aided in committing and i resolved to quit alp the very first opportunity this however did not occur immediately for before i could prepare my plans the players had left the place and i was obliged to remain in my sanguinary profession for another year during which i learned by heart every play that had ever been written in the french language one day while i was sitting alone reading rotru a man came in and addressed me with an air of cajolery which instantly put me on my guard but when he gave me to understand after a thousand doublings that he wished to know if ever i had heard my father or as he called him master talk of certain papers belonging to the late count de bagnol which might be of the greatest service in clearing the honour of his family and when at the same time he offered me ten louis d'or if i could find the papers i became as pliant as wax slipped one hand into the drawer took the money with the other delivered the papers and recommenced my book my father never missed the papers and when the players returned i lost no time but addressed myself to their manager who made me recite some verses applauded me highly declared he wanted a new star and that if i would steal away from my gallipots and join the company a mile from Al, i should meet with my desert i took him at his word and easily executed my plan during the apothecary's absence my name was soon changed to achilles le Front, and the provincial spectators found out that i was a genius of a superior class ambition the fault of gods misled our little troop and thinking to carry all before us we went to paris obtained permission to perform and chose a deep tragedy at which the malicious parisians roared with laughter from beginning to end we slunk out of paris in the middle of the night but the bond of union was gone amongst us and we dispersed since then i have hawked my talents from village to village and from company to company sometimes i have risen to the highest flights of tragedy and have trod the stage as a king or a hero and at others i have descended to the lowest walk of comedy 
and for the sake of a mere dinner performed the part of jester at a marriage entertainment or a fete de village i have been applauded and hissed wept at and laughed at but i have always contrived to make my way through the world till here i am at last your lordship's humble servant End of chapter twenty